Every living thing on Earth is made of a collection of different cells, all of which work together for survival. All cells are made of molecules, such as water, ions, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. The only way to get molecules into the body is through eating or breathing, injection or infection, or through maternal blood supply or yolk. The process of life needs a constant supply of these molecules in order to build and repair cells of the body. Most molecules enter the body through the digestive system in the form of food. The digestive system is a long, continuous muscular tube consisting of several primary organs. This tube of collective organs is also known as the gastrointestinal tract, here are now referred to as the GI tract. The GI tract provides the space for digestion and allows for selective absorption of molecules into our bloodstream and lymph. The reason absorption is referred to as selective is because not all we bring in is allowed to enter the bloodstream and lymph. The entry is tightly regulated. Along the way, the primary digestive organs are assisted by several accessory organs that may or may not come into direct contact with the food being digested and absorbed. The primary organs of the GI tract are the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine or colon, and rectum and anus. The accessory organs include the teeth, salivary glands, pancreas, and liver. Shortly, we will talk about what happens to a food item as it passes through the GI tract from mouth to anus. As we do this, there will be an emphasis on the six basic processes that occur within the GI tract. The first process is ingestion, which is the process of taking in foods and liquids through the mouth. In other words, this is eating and drinking. The second process, which will start in the mouth, is digestion, the process of breaking down food molecules into smaller forms for absorption. There are mechanical and chemical digestion types. The third process, also starting in the mouth, is secretion, which is the release of water, acids, buffers, and enzymes into the GI tract. Altogether, a total of 7 liters of fluid is secreted into the GI tract per day. The fourth process is motility, which also starts in the mouth and involves mixing and moving food and secretions through the GI tract towards the anus. These movements can be voluntary, controlled by the cerebrum, or involuntary, controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Some movements include peristalsis, propulsion and retropulsion, segmentation, and hostile churning. The fifth process is absorption, which occurs almost exclusively in the small and large intestines and involves the taking up of water and nutrients into the bloodstream and lymph for transport to bodily tissues. The sixth and final process is defecation, the elimination of wastes and other substances from the body. Other substances can include indigestible material, bacteria, and sloughed off cells from the GI lining. Parasites can also be defecated if the person is infected. So let's start with the cephalic phase. The cephalic phase, or head phase, prepares the mouth and stomach for the food that is about to be ingested. The sight, smell, taste, or thought of food activates neural centers in the cerebrum, hypothalamus, and medulla oblongata, and responses are then sent to salivary glands in the mouth to stimulate salivation, and also to the stomach where stimulation leads to the secretion of gastric juices. So let's start the journey through the GI tract. We will begin with the ingestion of a cheeseburger, which has a bun, starch, lettuce with cellulose, proteins, and nucleic acids, cheese with lactose, proteins, and lipids, and a beef patty with glycogen, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Upon entering the mouth, the cheeseburger is masticated, or chewed, by the teeth. This form of mechanical digestion is so important because it is the process by which food is manipulated by the tongue, ground down by the teeth, and mixed with saliva. Altogether, mastication breaks the food down into small, soft pieces of food collectively referred to as a bolus, which is a soft, flexible food mass, which can then be easily swallowed. In addition to the mechanical digestive process of mastication, 
chemical digestion begins in the mouth as well. This involves saliva, which is secreted into the mouth by various salivary glands. In the saliva, there is mucus, which lubricates the food bolus to make it easier to swallow, lysozyme to kill any potential bacteria in food, salivary amylase, which begins the chemical digestion of starches into smaller polysaccharides, and lingual lipase, which is inactivated at this point, but will begin lipid digestion once in the stomach. What comes next is deglutination, or swallowing, and this involves the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus, all of which work together to transport, transport the food into the stomach. Upon entering the stomach, the food bolus leads to distension and an increase in pH. The result is the initiation of the gastric phase, which promotes stomach activity through increased secretion of gastric juice and increased motility. The stomach, the most extensible part of the GI tract, and serving as a mixing chamber and holding reservoir, contains several different cell types in the mucosal lining. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, the inactivated form of pepsin, a potent protein digesting enzyme, and gastric lipase, which digests lipids. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid, required to activate pepsinogen. Mucus cells secrete a layer of alkaline mucus that protects other cells lining the stomach from hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Otherwise, most cells would get broken down by this protein digesting enzyme and destroyed by the hydrochloric acid. Lastly, we have G cells, which secrete gastrin a hormone that stimulates hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen release, promotes stomach contractions and motility, tightens the lower esophageal sphincter, and loosens the pyloric sphincter leading to the small intestine. Now back to the food bolus entering the stomach. Upon entering the acidic environment of the stomach, salivary amylase is denatured and deactivated. However, a new set of enzymes begin to function in chemical digestion. Lingual lipase, activated by the acidic environment, and gastric lipase, secreted by chief cells in the stomach, work together to begin to digest lipids into fatty acids and diglycerides. Pepsinogen is activated by hydrochloric acid to become pepsin, which then begins to digest proteins into peptides. Mechanical digestion of the food bolus is occurring at the same time as all this chemical digestion thus allowing for a greater rate of overall digestion. Mechanical digestion in the stomach involves peristaltic movements called propulsion and retropulsion. Propulsion is the propelling of the gastric contents towards the pyloric sphincter, which is open ever so slightly to allow only the smallest contents through and into the small intestine. Retropulsion is the splashback of the gastric contents that are too large to fit through the narrow opening of the pyloric sphincter. The repeating rounds of propulsion and retropulsion thoroughly mixes the digesting food bolus with gastric juice and other gastric contents, thus becoming chyme, a thick milkshake-like slurry of broken down food particles. Once food particles in the chyme become small enough, they can pass through the narrow opening of the pyloric sphincter and into the small intestine. This is a process called gastric emptying. Next up is the intestinal phase in the small intestine. The small intestine is the organ that will finalize the digestion of the majority of food particles and is the only organ that involves the digestion of all four biological molecules carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. The small intestine is also the organ where over 90% of all absorption occurs. The chyme, now entering the small intestine, is a slurry of partially digested starch, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Many food molecules haven't been digested yet at all, and even those that have been still require further breakdown before being absorbable. The inflow of chyme from the stomach causes the duodenum to distend and experience a decrease in pH, both of which initiate the intestinal phase of digestion. This phase 
promotes intestinal, pancreatic, and hepatic activities while suppressing the activity of the stomach. First, the enterogastric reflex leads to the inhibition of gastric motility and gastric emptying through closing the pyloric sphincter. Second, two digestive hormone, hormones, cholecystokinin, or CCK, and secretin, are secreted from enteroendocrine cells of the small intestine. These hormones work together to stimulate the secretion of pancreatic enzymes and secretion of bile from the gallbladder, which was originally produced by the liver. In the small intestine, bile emulsifies lipids in the chyme, breaking them up into numerous small fatty globules available for digestion. Pancreatic lipase then digests these remaining lipids into fatty acids and monoglycerides. Pancreatic amylase will digest the remaining starches into various polysaccharides. Protein digesting enzymes from the pancreas, trypsin and carboxypeptidase, will work together to digest proteins into peptides and then into amino acids. And now, for the first time in the GI tract, DNA and RNA to nuclear, nucleic acids will be digested into nucleotides by deoxyribonucleus and ribonucleus, both of which are from the pancreas. All in all, pancreatic enzymes will, with help from bile, digest significant amounts of food molecules. However, there remain significant quantities of peptides and polysaccharides that require final digestion into absorbable forms not to mention the nucleotides that need further digestion as well. This is where intestinal brush border enzymes come in. Brush border enzymes, which are permanently embedded within the mucosal layer of the small intestine, includes alpha dextrinase, which will digest alpha dextrins into two molecules of glucose, sucrase, to digest sucrose into glucose and fructose, lactase, to digest lactose into glucose and galactose, maltase to digest maltose into two molecules of glucose, aminopeptidase to digest any remaining peptides into amino acids, and you have nucleosidases together with phosphatases to digest nucleotides into their nitrogenous bases, sugars, and phosphates. All in all, the final digestive processes occurring in the small intestine are primarily through a collective effort of intestinal brush border enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, and bile. What comes after the digestion of food molecules into their small absorbable components is absorption of these nutrients into the bloodstream and lymph. Absorption is enhanced through the immense surface area provided by the intestinal circular folds, villi, and microvilli, but also by a special type of intestinal movement called segmentation. This movement involves alternating bouts of contraction and relaxation of smooth muscle to churn and mix the digesting food molecules with digestive juices, and to bring the food molecules into contact with the absorptive cells for digestion and absorption. For absorption, nutrients will enter the absorptive cells and enter either blood capillaries or lymphatic capillaries, here called lacteals, both of which are located in the villi. Entering the blood capillary and bloodstream via facilitated diffusion and secondary active transport are all monosaccharides and about 95 to 98 percent of all amino acids. Entering the lacteal and lymph via simple diffusion are 95 percent of all fatty acids and mono and diglycerides. Lastly, approximately 89% of all water is absorbed in the small intestine via osmosis, whereby water follows the nutrients and ions that are absorbed. In the end, what reaches the end of the small intestine is a mass of occasional nutrients, some water, mucus, non-digestible material, degraded enzymes, sloughed off cells, and various waste products. This mass is what enters the large intestine, aka the colon, for the final modifications and compaction before excretion. The large intestine consists of the cecum, 
and ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colons, all before leading into the rectum and anus. The primary functions of the large intestine are threefold. One, to absorb some remaining water, ions, and vitamins via absorptive cells. Second, to utilize the local bacterial flora to ferment, aka chemically digest, any remaining carbohydrates and absorb the products. Waste products are excreted and also released via flatulence. And third, the large intestine forms feces to be excreted. The large intestine is a highly motile organ in that there are three types of movements. As has been the case throughout the entire GI tract, peristalsis is slowly moving the fecal mass towards the rectum. One movement unique to the large intestine is hostile churning, which is when the intestinal hostra fill up, becoming distended, and then contract in response to squeeze the contents into the next hostrum. This movement is important in not only moving the fecal mass through the large intestine, but it also functions to effectively squeeze out as much of the remaining water from the developing feces as possible. The third and strongest and perhaps longest duration movement that occurs in the large intestine is called mass movement. This movement occurs roughly three to four times per day and typically occurs midway along the transverse colon and continues to the rectum. The intention of mass movement is to speed up the elimination of waste products so the GI tract can accommodate and deal with a new batch of incoming food. Mass movement is one of the main reasons behind why you might have to defecate shortly after eating a large meal or drinking coffee, which stimulates mass movement. Now this leads us to the last part of the GI tract, which is the rectum and anus. Entering the rectum is the finalized product the result of all the digestion and absorption that occurred along the entire length of the GI tract. After ingesting the cheeseburger, masticating it, swallowing it, digesting it in the stomach, further digesting and absorbing most of the nutrients and water in the small intestine, absorbing some of the remaining nutrients and water and creating the feces in the large intestine, we now have a compact mass of fecal waste that is ready to be excreted. This leads to the defecation reflex and also the conscious decision to defecate. Distension of the rectum caused by the entering and building up of feces leads to the relaxation of the internal anal sphincter and stimulation of peristaltic contractions of the rectum. All this is the defecation reflex and is behind the feeling of pressure and internal movement you feel when you have to defecate. Fortunately, the external anal sphincter is under conscious control by the cerebrum. And therefore, defecation requires relaxation of this sphincter and contraction of the abdominal and pelvic muscles to defecate. If this was not the case, then we would have no control over when and where defecation occurred. Once the external anal sphincter is relaxed, defecation can occur. If the sphincter is voluntarily contracted and we hold it, the defecation is postponed until we are ready to finalize the, the last bit of the digestive process.